glad that you are joining with us today, and we're going to talk about the challenges of relationships, specifically within our family. So families, go ahead right now, turn to each other and say, this is for you. And if you're watching solo, I just want to encourage you that this message is for you too. You know, the fact is that relationships are hard, aren't they? And for some reason, it's our relationships at home that seem to be the first to slip into dysfunction. You know, early in Julie and I's marriage, we, we learned a lot. Like, when your wife comes home from the stylist and asks how her hair looks, don't filter your, your response through your own bad day, your own bad attitude, or, or, or those frustrating moments right before she arrived home. Don't do that. Or you're going to hear words come out of your own mouth like, you paid for that? Which, I'm just saying, could be followed by several hours, even days of silence. Possibly later days, just, just a few days later, you might even catch out of the corner of your eye a glass flying at your head. Could happen. You know, for us... It took a few tries to honestly learn the concepts of how to actually deal with strife and tension and, and conflict in our young family. But we did, and we're still working on it. You know, unfortunately, I think that you'd agree that there are many families today that still haven't learned how to handle those conflicts really any differently than Julie and I did. But, you know, the key is learning that it takes someone making peace to end that unhealthy behavior. And, and I want to show you how to do that today. So if you've got your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and we're looking at one of the Beatitudes. Now, I want you to realize that Jesus was talking to everybody in this passage. But what we're doing for the purpose of our study is we're, we're looking and applying the Beatitudes to our, to our families. So why don't you go ahead and look at what Matthew 5, verse 9 says. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And I really want to encourage you to commit that to memory. So let's say this together. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. But you know, so many homes aren't characterized as homes of peace. They're characterized by conflict and tension and strife. But I believe that God has something better for us. I want you to know that no matter what tension or strife has existed in, in your past or exists right now in your family, it can change starting today. I want you to know that. I also want to just remind you that Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15 says we're called to peace. See, peace is one of the fruits of the Spirit, and it's a, it's a byproduct of our relationship with Jesus. And if we remain in him, if our homes are Christ-centered, we will have peace in our homes. And you know, when the Bible talks about peace, I just, I need you to understand this. It's more than just the absence of bad. It also means the highest good. So as we talk about being a peacemaker today, I'm not just saying that I, I want your home to be strife-free. No, I want you to have the highest good in your home. So let's look back at that verse and what it says again. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And you'll notice that Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the, the peacekeepers. No, he said, blessed are the peacemakers. And there's a huge difference. What are peacekeepers? Listen, peacekeepers, they often avoid all conflict to keep the peace. Peacekeepers, they're going to work around the issue, not through the issue or on the issue to keep the peace. See, we get to this place sometimes, and it happens from time to time to all of us, where we say, okay, let's just, let's just make a truce. I just don't want to talk about it anymore, right? It's kind of like being at the dinner table, and there's a heated discussion that's going on, and, and uh, faces are beat red, and all of a sudden, somebody pops up and just says, uh, more cake, anybody? In other words, 
We have an unresolved issue that just got buried. But listen, Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. No. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. And what will a peacemaker do? Listen, a peacemaker is going to embrace that conflict to make peace. A peacemaker is going to say things like, we're not going to work around the issue or side skirt it. We're going to together walk through this issue and work through it. And with the help of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, I know that there can be peace in our homes. You know, James says it's actually wise to love peace. Look at James chapter 3 with me, starting in verse 17. It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first all pure, then peace-loving It's considerate, it's submissive, full of mercy and good fruit. It's impartial and it's sincere. I love this. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Listen, you'll gain righteousness. And Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, let me ask you, would you have more joy in your life if you were at peace with everyone in your life? Would, uh, would it be better to, that your boss, your, your spouse, your siblings, your parents, and, and your children, if, if, there was, if there was peace, could there be more joy? Absolutely. Proverbs 12.20 says, there's deceit in the hearts of those who plot evil, but joy for those who promote peace. See, peacemakers are going to have more joy in their life. And I thank God that you can have peace with people. Believe it. Today, it's for you. It's possible. I love Psalms 34 in verse 14. It says, turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. See, peacekeepers, listen, they just try to hold on to the appearance of peace, the little scraps of peace that they can, but that's not what we're called to. See, peace is something that needs to be diligently sought after and pursued. And as a follower of Christ... That's how we're instructed to live. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he gives us some sound teaching on on how to live our lives. And he talks about peace in Romans chapter 12. Look at that with me. In verse 15, it says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of, of low position. Don't be conceited. Don't repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Great instruction. But this is the power scripture right here. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, what are you to do? Come on, read the rest with me. Live at peace with everyone. Now listen, you can't always control how others are going to respond. You can't force people to have the right heart or the right attitude, but you can, with God's help, and the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, you can control yourself, you can guard your own heart, and you can do what is right. And I I love the way the New Living Translation words this. It says this, do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. So we gotta take action, we have to be a peacemaker. Now, I just want to tell you, for those of you, you're sitting back and you're a lazy boy under the Cardinal's blanket thinking, man, where's the remote? I, I need to turn this up because she needs to hear this or, or he needs to hear this. No, turn it up. Let God speak to you as far as it depends on you. You need to do everything possible to live at peace. Uh, today, I want to show you three things that you can do to be a peacemaker in your own home. Okay, the first one is this, tell the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 says this, speak the truth in love, growing, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Doesn't say yell the truth, doesn't say be combative or angry and sinful, but tell the truth in love. That's what peacemakers do. See, peacekeepers, man, they ignore the issue. They pretend it isn't there. And and things usually will get worse. Peacekeeping is a passive thing. Doesn't really resolve an issue. But how many of you know that you can do 
nothing wrong and still be doing nothing right. It's like you can put a lid on the situation instead of stirring it up, but, it, but nothing inside there has been resolved. And we have to take every effort to live at peace. And, and that means taking action. 1 John 3.18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or, or just tongue, but with action and in truth. We can't just bottle it all up anymore. And I, I want to give you just a few practical tips on how to tell the truth in love. And you should really write these down today. So, so the first one, to tell the truth in love, write this down. You do it during non-conflict times. Everybody catch that? Non-conflict. That's when we work on important issues. In other words, if someone is throwing a glass at your head because they're angry, that's not the time to raise a new issue, okay? All right. Secondly, write this down. You confront the issue, never the person, okay? The issue. And the third thing to write down is, is give the benefit of the doubt. Listen, you might not know the whole story of what's going on in their heart. So don't assume the worst. You know, I have to admit that there's been times that, that I've wished that I would have waited to speak because I, I found out that my wife's day was, was horrible. And that's why she reacted in the moment that she did. I could have brought peace, but I made it worse. And in James 1.19, it tells us, listen, everybody should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. And you can prevent all kinds of strife in your home by living by that verse. But listen, don't be afraid to tell the truth in love. And it, it, it can sound like this. Listen, I, I know that you love me, but when you don't listen to me, I feel like you don't value me. See, that's a statement. This is how I feel when you do this. And when you... When you, when you have these conversations, it might be something like this. When you lie to me about something really insignificant, I, I find it difficult to trust you. Right? We're confronting the issue, not the person. It might sound like this. When, when you're continuing to check your phone at the dinner table, the rest of us feel devalued. We're confronting the issue, not the person. And we do it at non-conflict times, and we always give the benefit of the doubt. All right, so we know that peacemakers tell the truth in love. And next, peacemakers apologize when they're wrong. Look with me at James chapter 5. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. Now, I want you to think about this scripture for a minute. What do you think your relationships would be like if when we sinned, we confessed it? Like we said, I am so sorry. What, what I did was wrong, and I sinned against you. Will, will you please forgive me? And then you prayed together? Man, can you imagine how incredibly different our relationships would be if we owned our own sins, we confessed them, and then we prayed together? See, peacemakers apologize when they're wrong. Romans 14, 19 says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. And there's, there's something so disarming about an apology that comes from the heart. So often this sincere apology really is all it takes to, to move forward a broken or a torn relationship. And, you know, really just a couple of practical trips, uh, tips on, on how you can do that is, is really admit to specific action without excuses. Like, here's what I did wrong. No excuses. Listen, if you're saying, I'm sorry that you got your feelings hurt, you giant baby, that's not an apology, okay? We apologize for specifics. I'm so sorry that, that I belittled you in front of, of your friends, and I have no excuse for that. I was wrong. Sounds like, hey, I'm sorry that I raised my voice to you like that. And, and, and I was disrespectful. Will you, will you please forgive me? Listen, there's a giant difference between remorse and repentance. And oftentimes, people stop with the remorse part. It's kind of like they're saying, well, I'm sorry I got caught. Really, that's what they're saying. It sounds like, I'm sorry we're having this hard time, 
Or I'm sorry that you got your feelings hurt. I'm sorry we're having to go through this right now. See, that's the remorse part. But repentance says, I was wrong. I sinned. I'm sorry, and will you forgive me? And see, when you sin, don't stop with the I'm sorry. I'm sorry is for mistakes. Will you forgive me is for sin. Listen, I'm sorry that I left the toilet seat up in the middle of the night and you fell in. Listen, that's an honest mistake. But will you forgive me for deceiving you? That's a sin. Don't just stop at I'm sorry. If you've sinned against someone, ask for forgiveness. So a peacemaker is going to tell the truth in love. They're going to apologize when they're wrong. And finally, peacemakers forgive and they let go. Jesus said in Luke 17, look at what it says. Luke 17, verse 3. It says, if your brother sin, rebuke him. Meaning, speak truth to him in love. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, Jesus says, forgive him. See, peacemakers forgive. But also, like Jesus, we let go of that wrong. You know, I have this image of Jesus literally throwing my sin off into the skyline and it just keeps going and going and going as far as the east is from the west like scripture says but I have to do the same thing as I forgive what others have hurt me or how they have sinned against me in that same way I have to let that sin go and and I know for a lot of you there's tremendous amounts of of pain or hurt associated with those things. Perhaps you've been abused or or cheated on. Maybe you've been lied to, been let down by someone that you look up to. And you're going to find it very difficult to forgive. But listen, it is incredibly important in a Christ-centered home to allow forgiveness to take place. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. It says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you might have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. See, because we are called to be peacemakers. And listen to me today. Our families are worth it. Listen, there are some of you that you call yourself a Christian and you haven't really been acting like it in your relationships inside your family. And if we're followers of Jesus, then we would forgive like we've been forgiven. Listen, I need you to hear this. We don't leave our spouses. We don't just uh, disown our kids. We don't write off our, our, our parents. We don't just walk away from our family. We don't cut family out because family is worth it. So we forgive as we've been forgiven. We show mercy as we've been shown mercy. And I want you to understand when when I talk about family, it's not just the family that shares blood. No, that family definition goes beyond all the way into the body of Christ. And, And when we act like Christ, we forgive, we show mercy, and when we act like him and we make peace, man, it's then that we're called children of God. And you know, when I look at my girls, my two girls, they both look a little bit like me. And guess what? When we make peace and we do everything possible to live at peace with everyone, guess who we look like? We look like our heavenly father, created in his image and being conformed to the likeness of his son. And I want you to know that, man, that's what our families need, especially during these current times, not more of me, but more of Jesus seen in me. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I want to pray for you. Will you bow your heads right where you're at? Jesus, in this moment, I just feel so impressed that there are families gathered in homes before TVs, maybe a spouse sitting together, 
And this, this moment even is, is filled with tension because they know that there are, there are things that need to be walked through. In their relationship in homes right now, there, there needs to be a peacemaker that rises up. So Father, I pray that you would help us, each of us, to, to bear that image of who you are in relationships right now, that we would speak truth and love right now in this moment. That God, that we would be willing to apologize. Lord, that we would forgive and let go. And Lord, I know that tensions sometimes run high as we can't really get out of the house. But God, I just pray for our families right now. Lord, that you would give them to just that strength to take your word and put it into action. God, for, for fathers to, to turn to their children and, and apologize for the things that they need to. Lord, for spouses to look each other in the eye and, and forgive like they've been forgiven by you. Lord, I pray that we might recognize that what our world needs more than anything, our communities, is a representation of who you are. And God, what greater place for that to occur than in our homes, within our family relationships. God, may our children see you in us as adults, as parents. Father, I pray that, God, that even parents would see Christ in their children as children learn to walk as peacemakers. Father, I, I thank you that your word is always right on time. And Father, I, I just, uh, I know that there are many that are going to just maybe even pause uh, this portion right now and they're going to begin to walk through some strife through some some issues and there's going to be some peacemakers that speak the truth and love even right now and God I pray that your spirit would be right there with them may they know God that this is you working in them and through them in their relationships thank you Jesus I want to also speak to some of you. Honestly, you know, maybe for you, you've never thought about the fact of a relationship with God. God cares about relationships. In fact, He cares so much about relationships that He sent Christ, Jesus, to die on a cross for you, to take the, the penalty for your sin and to forgive you and to restore that relationship with a heavenly father that man, he's better than any earthly father. And listen, he desires a restored relationship with you. It's not about formality. It's not about you acting a certain way. It's about being in a right relationship with the creator of the world that sent the savior of the world to die for you and to forgive you. You can be made brand new. Bible says a brand new creation and really it's not that hard in fact scripture says this that if if we will repent if we'll confess and turn from our sin that Jesus is faithful that he's just and he'll forgive us our sins and it's as simple as praying a prayer and I want to encourage you that as I lead you in this prayer to think about these words and then mean them in your heart and then to trust that the creator of it all desires relationship with you. Pray this prayer with me, will you? Dear Jesus, forgive me for my sin. I'm sorry for the things that I've done. I thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. 
and I am turning away from my sin today. I want a relationship with you. In Jesus' name.